Good afternoon and welcome to Afrikaans Wild Moments, powered by explore.org. I hope you're all very well wherever you happen to be on planet Earth. My name is James Henry, and that fellow waving at you uh, in the conservatory of his home in the Cape is Russell Gerber. <laughs> Hello, Hello, James. Russell. Yes, coming to you live from the West Wing. Good to uh, good, good to be back. Good. I am coming to you live this evening from the uh, well, somewhat cooler climes of Westville in KwaZulu Natal. Uh, it's uh, very pleasant down here, and I'm in my parents-in-law's home, which is why it looks so executive behind me. <laughs> Good. If you haven't watched this show before, it's not a show about Russell and I and where we're sitting. It's a show of the highlights that we've caught on the AfriCam live cameras during the course of the week. You're welcome to ask us any questions that you'd like to. We'd love to hear from you during the course of the next half an hour or so. It really does help if you talk to us. Um, then it's not just the two of us waffling at each other, but it includes you in the conversation. And we're going to focus largely on lions today, but in order to start off uh, the excitement of the half hour, we're going to begin with something else. There we go. What could be going on here? Here are some water bugs. <laughs> they are peacefully drinking. There's some egrets, and this looks like a spoonbill off to the right. I think two spoonbills mm -hmm. actually two of them. off to the right. Right, a bull water buck, two cow water bucks, the ever faithful blacksmith lapwing. Looks fairly innocuous at the moment, but what could happen here? I'm assuming this is a Tau, which is in the decoy game reserve. Yes, it was a Tau. Now watch carefully everyone, and don't get a fright. <laughs> <laughs> I must say, I got a fright in this particular size. <laughs> a huge fright. I'm going to get one again. The <laughs> 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 apers. All right. I, I don't think we can, but it'll be hell of a nice to watch that frame by frame. So in case you didn't see that, I actually genuinely did get another fright there. That crocodile, not as much of a fright as the water buck car got, but that crocodile came out of the water at such astonishing speed. Grabbed the water buck by the nose. Yo, does it get it on the nose? Oh, yeah, oh yeah on the nose. Just explodes out of stuff. the water. Yeah. yeah. And I imagine that the water buck is probably quite severely wounded about the nose round about now because to make a crocodile let go like that or sort of slip off i think the bite must i mean you know you must it must have probably torn some flesh to get away because those crocs don't let go yeah i was um, thinking the same thing it, it must have yeah. must have ripped through something maybe her her yeah. top lip or or something else yeah, yeah. <laughs> for it to let go like that yeah. What a cool Let's just sight. watch it once more because it's absolutely astonishing. <laughs> now, you must understand that something like a water buck reacts with a, a speed that is far, far in excess of anything a human could manage. And for the crocodile to have caught it unawares just speaks volumes to how unbelievably fast they are. I mean, that is less than a tenth of a second after the crocodile came out of the water. No. No. So, again, yeah? No, I was just going to say, it's amazing, you know, how, I mean, how shallow that water is there. And, and, you know, on our beautiful 4K or 8K camera, you know, you can't mm. see anything. There's no sign no. at all of that croc in that, in that sighting. And it actually makes me think of you know, a number of guests. I'm sure you've had the same, James. You always ask about waterbuck and lechwe, Sitatunga, if you ever see one. But, uh, mm. you know, these more 
water-bound antelope and how they tend to use water as a place of refuge when being chased you know the big mammal predators and then people often ask well what about crocodiles well there you have it i mean that it's it, it's yeah. absolutely dangerous for them to go for the water yeah. but i guess they make their their choices and calculated risk and that's where mm. where their species has ended up i suppose in a place like the delta the water is generally a lot clearer you know on those kalahari sands as opposed to in the muddy water hole here in south africa but still there is absolutely an element of risk involved. Yeah, no, no, I, think yeah, so, I mean, there are astounding. certainly very because clear Marcella, channels in the Delta. Yeah. Hmm. As Marcella Viega mm -hmm. says, the sighting is unbelievable. It seemed so peaceful until then. That's really the thing with the bush, though, isn't it? It can give one a sense of incredible peace and uh, sort of yeah just a, a it can infuse one with peace but at the same time bubbling underneath the surface there's always something trying to hunt something else uh, which is i think <laughs> half of what makes it so compelling agreed i think it's what makes then, traveling uh, to the bush addictive for so many yeah. guests you know that come year after year and over and over and for yourself and myself and now spouses and family how you know going on holiday to the bush doesn't seem like uh, anything repetitive it's just where you want to no. go it's a it's an amazingly yeah. magical place i i agree yeah and this with this underlying element of danger which i think you know, does yeah. make it so compelling all right a couple of greetings from Gemma. good day all looking forward to the show today from new jersey usa rainy and cool day here well i might assume springs on its way andy ready for the show where's the popcorn we're not allowed to eat while we present andy james richard hello saski brianda good day from florida hot windy and steamy yes i suspect it's going to get worse over the next couple of months jan powers hello from arizona lisa white from wa state is that washington state is it yep no is it it is washington state john good morning from windy florida and marcella Hello from sunny Buenos Aires, Argentina. Really nice. Hello, Marcella. Very nice. Winter coming to you. Same as it's coming to us. Okay. OMG 23. Uh, you want to know how big that croc is? Russ, how big do you think it was? I don't know. I mean, it wasn't, wasn't as big as we've ever seen. I, I reckon probably around the two meter mark with the tail. Yeah. Uh, maybe a bit bigger, but I don't think much more. Yeah. I think it might have had yeah. much better luck if it went for that younger calf on the other mm. side of the of the water hole. It might not have gotten away, but yeah, yeah, not the biggest croc. No, two meters, seven feet or so, probably just under seven feet. Mm. Uh, I would have said roughly the same. Of course, mainly because Russell said it first, and therefore <laughs> I don't have to guess myself. Um, <laughs> I did want to say one other thing about the crocodile sighting, and that is that you know Africa. If you go to the Olympic Games, there are not a lot of African nations that send people to sw to, to to swimming events. Swimming is not a huge thing in land Africa. It is on the coastal areas, and I, I mean, as a child, it always used to. I used to wonder why the guys where we would go on holiday to the Eastern Cape, where the local kids swim far better with no lessons swim far better than i ever have but if you go inland nobody goes near water in fact there's a real fear of water and it's largely i think a tradition of crocodiles and possibly hippopotami but you know crocs you just never can tell where they are and if there's a puddle big enough for one to be in then you avoid it if you can if you're living in a rural area and i remember no, i mean we were in minor pools recently and just about every little puddle of water had a crocodile of some description sitting in it. So if it was a small puddle, there was a small croc waiting in there. So, yeah, I think, you know, there are such lurkers and they do move from waterhole to waterhole. And as Russell says, you know, we often ask things like, well, is there a crocodile in there? And my answer was always, I don't know, because you hear <laughs> dreadful stories of people saying, no, 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 no crocodiles in here. And then, obviously, that's their famous last words. And there's that very famous story of 
a famous guide called Christian Buckus, who lost an arm exactly like that when he was very young, long before he became uh, a famous and, I mean, highly sought after guide, mainly in Namibia, that he lost his arm at Angala to a crocodile uh, on a hot day, thinking that a, a waterhole was free of crocodiles, when in fact it wasn't. That's a lesson for us all. Okay, that's enough about crocodiles. Let's move on to our next sighting now. Now these lions are the lions at Tembe Game Reserve. Uh, F70, very romantically named female. <laughs> uh, greedy, the male. And a start, the other female. So it's F70, I think, is looking at us. Looks like she's got suckle marks, but apparently doesn't have cubs. Uh, Greedy is the one looking away from us, and then we've got a start fast asleep. Now, yeah. what it looks like there is that that lioness is lactating, but I think when we looked at them catching fish that one time, it looked like she was lactating, and that was many, many weeks ago, and we haven't seen any sign of new cubs, so... I mean, I don't know. What do you think, Russell? You've probably lost them. I think so, James. I mean, these she's been hanging out with these two cubs of hers for an age now. You know, as long as yeah. as long as I've been with Africam, they've been hanging out okay. together. Um, and as you say, no sign of of cubs in the interim. Um, for a few months, I feel like for a couple of months, I'm sure the viewers can back me up here that mm. we were seeing. Um, a starte or a start, I don't know how, we, how we've decided we pronounced it, and, and know, Greedy yeah. hanging out quite a lot together without the mom. So that may well have been at that time, and then she subsequently mm. lost the cubs. Um, yes. It's very possible. Okay. Yeah. So basically we're going to discuss these lions now. We've got another three clips of them, and we're going to discuss them. I just want to check if there are any questions particularly on this. Uh, before we move to the next one, we'll answer on Christine and Valentina's question. I think that's one person. Um, hello, James and Russell. Question about lion behavior. When one is elderly or ailing, is it typical to isolate themselves from the pride coalition or does the pride drive one out? Uh, by one, I'm assuming you're not referring to yourself in the third person on Christine. The lion pride would eat you. It would not drive you out uh, if you became old and decrepit in their presence. Uh, in general, on Christine, the lions will just be get so old that they're unable to either defend themselves or to keep up with the pride, and the pride will then just kind of leave them leave them be, and then they will probably isolate themselves and either be sadly, it, it, very few animals die a peaceful death in old age. You know, she'll sadly become too weak to defend herself. Hyenas will come across her, strange male, other lionesses might come across her. She might stray onto farmland, and normally it's a fairly violent death after that. Sadly, I like concur. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> uh, no, yeah. I think that that's, that's very much the tale yeah. of the end of life for many of the big predators. Well, as you say, many of the big animals, any animals yeah. in African bush, um, as you say, very seldom that you see one who has died without some form of suffering, whether it be yeah. actually tormented by another animal or simply unable to feed anymore, which is sometimes more difficult to watch. Yeah. You know? um, yeah. it's but it's a mm. sad reality of uh, of the animals that live out there. Um, yeah. but as, you, as, as our guest or viewer, put you know we we often don't see that they do tend to isolate and mm. uh, and disappear into the bushes and more often than not in my experience james you, you know you tend to come across the remains of the animal rather than actually yeah. see it happen um but uh who knows who knows how how it all yeah. happens but i find that they tend to try and hide out when they can no longer mm. feed themselves yeah but eventually, they, I mean, yeah, if they're lucky, they'll get to die on their own. And if they're unlucky, they'll be found by a pack of hyenas, a group of hyenas or whatever it is. Anyway, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, death in the wild tends to be a very uncheerful thing. It's not very cheerful anywhere, 
really, uh, <laughs> but it's especially uncheerful if it's violent and at the teeth of a hyena, I think. Okay, um, let's quickly go on to the next clip then. And what we have here is quite interesting and possibly worth some discussion. So there we have the same three lions, mother watching out towards the left, kids fiddling about on the right, and then disturbing occurrence if you happen to be a human being. <laughs> Not yet. Ah. <laughs> there you have it. There, there you have it in really quite extraordinarily graphic detail. Africam does Game of Thrones, basically. <laughs> <laughs> now, we'll wait. For, I, I don't feel like I can talk over that. I feel like obliged to <laughs> let it play out before we discuss it. And I know somebody's going to complain that I'm laughing at this like a stupid teenager which I am, because <laughs> it looks quite amusing to me. Um, it is natural, and we will discuss why it's natural. Oh, I thought we were going to have a repeat performance. Okay, so... <laughs> no, I think that's it. Just in case you didn't realize what was going on there, we've got a male sibling... Uh, mating with a female and probably about two and a half I would have said uh, maybe a little mm -hmm. bit older than that and she's obviously his litter mate and so they are full siblings and they are mating or are they Russell what do you think no I don't think so I think uh, it's it's just a little bit of of uh, interaction between them sometimes uh a bit of dominance in in many ways as one trying to show dominance over the other you see that with between males young males often as well um and i think a little bit of a learning curve you know for for the female she will be close to if not already actually able mm -hmm. to conceive if i'm not mistaken mm -hmm. um and uh, uh you know this is why in most cases if there is a big dominant male around he will chase the males away uh they're his progeny or sons uh it's inbreeding in lions is very common i think in many cat species um you see it often yeah. um and i think i read not too long ago that around three or four generations of inbreeding is tolerable within lion genetics and after that you start to see some real uh impacts on the strength of the offspring but yeah it, you see it quite often uh, we, uh, it's it, yeah. Very common in, in my experience with lions around this age in the same pride. Yeah. I think what's quite interesting there, I think you're right. I do think that she is most likely starting to come. She may even be coming into estrus. And so he will be uh, experiencing a, a, a wash of pheromones that he wouldn't have experienced before. And they will be having an effect on his body that they wouldn't have had before if he had smelt them because he is now also sort of going into puberty that's why he's getting a slightly ridiculous beard which will event eventually become an impressive mane and he's just acting on instinct and of course there's absolutely no uh, cultural norm that says he shouldn't uh, mate with his sister and as russell's just said biologically it actually doesn't make much difference as long as it doesn't happen too frequently and evolution has very kindly put in a mechanism by which the inbreeding is limited to a certain extent with the males being chased away at around about this age and lisa white you're wondering when do i think or when do we think greedy will be pushed out uh, you think mum is trying to currently i don't think mum will try and push him out at all i think mum would very happily tolerate him for as long as necessary 
uh, even to the point of his being becoming the, the dominant male. So if there were no dominant males in the area, she'd tolerate him, she'd mate with him, and he could quite easily become the dominant male of the pride. Uh, so that's really not, not unusual, as Russell was saying. Yeah, I think the the only real way he's going to leave in any form is is the you know the big male, and I think we have a clip coming up later on, yeah. uh, the dominant male in the area, you know, who who will likely chase him out. Uh, that that's mm. very likely to happen soon. He'll, yeah. I suspect, greedy will make himself more and more scarce when that big male comes around. Yeah. Um, and uh, once his mom. Uh, who F70 and his sister start going into full estrus and that big male is around, he's not going to tolerate little no. old greedy's present, e presence either. No. So it might be, might be soon. It, it's hard to say. Mm. Let's, let's have a look at that clip now, if we can. And we'll just prevail. There we go. So they're the same three lions. And here comes the big chap. And you can see they're all weary of him. Uh, I just want to get his romantic name because it's a really terrifying name. Right up there with Mufasa. M179. How's that? Magnificent. M179 walking towards our three lions. Now, what's not unusual here is that they should all move away from him. You can see his head is up. He's striding after them. He's definitely trying to cut them off. I'm not sure if he was calling at this stage. But most likely trying to put old Greedy, which is quite likely his son, although apparently there's some debate over that. Try most likely trying to put him to flight. A classic shot of a tree. water I, th I think he does cut them off let's just uh, listen yeah, for a sec sure he does. beautiful night sound by the way September oh, there we go there they go So there's a proper fight going on. Mm. Now, whether that was with Greedy or possibly even with F70 trying to defend Greedy, uh, I, I don't. I'm, yeah, I'm, I've, I think that's probably more likely because I suspect the young male would have just run. Don't you? Yeah, I'm with you. I, I reckon if that was a fight, it was, it was mom. Um, and yeah. she is still quite protective over over them, but and has been very wary of other. Lions, not long ago, we had another big pride that came into the area um, that they had few tussles with. Um, so I, I'm with you, James. I reckon that fight would have been mom and that, that big male. Um, yeah. The greedy would have hightailed it out of there, no question. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think he would have hung around to find out what was going on. Uh, so his days are limited experimenting with his sister. And, well, that'll be quite good for their genetics, probably. But remember that that dominant male, M179, romantically named, is of course the father, or m most likely the father of Astarte or Astarte or Astarete or whatever her name is, uh, <laughs> A-S-T-A-R-T-E. And, and <laughs> he could quite easily mate with her. So if she's coming into Eustress now, he'll definitely mate with her. Yeah. So that's also quite interesting. And they're just as... Well, I mean, they share 50% of their genetics, which is totally uh, fine, really. Now, what's interesting also, I think, in nature, when we talk about these sorts of things, is that if you look at inbreeding in animals, where, where it is, let's look at human beings, for example, where with human beings, inbreeding over one generation can cause horrific kind of uh, anomalies and often 
uh, fatal anomalies in, on, and defects, birth defects, we have a cultural norm that says it shouldn't happen. And we're actually biologically programmed uh, to find that kind of thing uh, offensive. Uh, it's not only cultural, it is biological as well, because, you know, our species has learned over time, and obviously I don't mean this consciously, that this sort of thing is deleterious to it. And I think there are a lot of species that are like that. And I suspect it happens in a number of primates, especially uh, where if you do have inbreeding over just one generation, it can be tremendously detrimental. And so it doesn't happen. What happens very seldom. Okay. Uh, Pounce, you say he showed up with wounds on his face yesterday. I'm assuming you mean young greedy showed up with wounds on his face. Yeah, he could well have. Is that what we're looking at now? My wife. Yeah, is that so looks like it. Amazingly yeah. fast. That looks like it, and he looks very uneasy as well. Yeah, maybe he did get a smack then. Maybe. Yeah. But I, I still think maybe. the growling and fighting we heard would have been yeah. mom trying to yeah. keep keep that big male away from him. I agree. But after that, he would never have stood his ground. I mean, yeah. he will he'll be no. killed. So. Yeah, murdered. I also think that, remember, if he did get wounded, I mean, for him to have turned and fought that big male lion, he'd have had to be cornered. He would never have turned and fought him in the open. So if the big male did get hold of him, it would have been on his backside, most likely. Uh, we didn't see his backside there, so maybe his backside is, is injured. But for him to have taken a facial wound from the big male there, He'd have had to have been cornered or caught and then turned and maybe took a swat, but that could easily have had been happened at a kill. You know, they could he he and his mm. mother or sister could have been feeding on something small and he would have just taken a swat or something like that. It may have been running through a bush, but yes, maybe the male did the big male did get hold of him. Fascinating. Pounce, you said, what age will she go into her first estrus? Uh, I. It's normally two years, Pounce, around about two years. So she'll be going into it, if not now, fairly soon. Okay. Yeah, no, I'm with you. Two years, All two right. and a half years sometimes. But I, I've heard, geez, I've heard of lions pregnant at 18 months. But I mean, it, yes. uh, two years yeah. is what the book says, basically. Yeah. Okay, so that's interesting. I'm not sure I've ever seen a lion, well, not knowingly seen a lion that young pregnant. But yeah, so I guess, I mean... When, yeah, in fact, you, you read about a first pr sort of early Easter's coming in at 18 months. So, yeah, I suppose it's well it's possible. possible. Yeah. Uh, Marty, aka the leopard lady, you said lion dynamics are so fascinating. They are absolutely fascinating. Oh, right, here we go. John, you say on Explore, we like to think of a start as a star on Tembi, a starte. A start, a start here. Okay, right. A star on timber. So that's where it comes from. Thank you very much All for right, that, John. Cool. Right, Carol Parker. Mm -hmm. You say hello from cold Ohio again. So enjoy the programs. Thank you, Carol. We enjoy having you with us. Thank you for sharing. The trait of sexual behaviour has carried down to house cats as well. Yes, I think Russell. If I'm not mistaken, a lot of cats exhibit exactly the same kind of tolerance to inbreeding. That's my understanding as well. It's not unique to lions. Um, they, you see it across across the various, um, yeah, the various cat species all over the world, from from the big ones to the house cats. You know, um, yeah. Uh, even yeah, I think I mean some of the more ancient, in terms of evolution, I think cheetah and puma are like one of the oldest, and they they even they have the you know similar similar kind of behavior. Yeah. And then Marcela Viegas is another one for you, Russell, because I have absolutely no idea. You say, how old is the mum lioness in Tembe? Do you know? I don't know off the top of my head. As I say, they've been around ever since I've been with Africam. Um, and uh, we haven't, it's been quite difficult to get info at, yeah. ex exactly about when she was born. So, no, um, it would be a guess. I've, I have no idea. I mean, to me, I've never seen her in the day except in the distance. I would have said she looks like a healthy lioness in her prime. I'm going to say mm. around six, six or seven, maybe. Uh, so, yeah, not yeah. old. She doesn't look old at all to me. No, um, no, I agree. Lisa White, 
you say mum and a start was seen there yesterday without greedy okay so greedy is definitely going to have to start moving on and obviously this is a, the next most difficult time for his life after he was just born very tough for him right that's it on the lions i'm just going to say a quick kelly says can i share my thoughts on the leopard tundi for those of you who don't know tundi was a very famous leopard that became famous on a show called safari live and she was killed uh, two days ago by we think another leopard anyway i just think that this is it's quite a nice thing to chat about briefly russell because these cats that like the the african cats like the rosie's pan female and like these lions they become very famous worldwide and it's so interesting and i think quite heartwarming how attached people become to them uh, in a way that I think is largely hugely beneficial to conservation because people become so attached to wild creatures and I, there are others there are some who say that we anthropomorphize them and that's very damaging but in in my opinion the attachment that people feel to these animals is actually far more beneficial than it is negative because it you know it it's like a it's a vehicle to understanding and a vehicle into conservation yeah i i agree i mean every guy that i know you know if you work long enough in a certain area uh, you know these mm. kinds of big species uh, are you know the things that people want to see most often so you you find yourself looking for them over and over seeing them almost on a daily basis certainly certain individuals or prides or herds whatever and there's no question you 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 get a huge attachment to them and it's uh yeah. it's pretty special you know you have people all over the world these days now you know with modern guiding and a lot of the guides in the bush who you know are basically putting pictures up of these animals from their whole life and you mm -hmm. know people who've come yeah. on a trip who've seen cubs born or newly born cubs and then carry on that they, they follow their whole life um up until the day they die um and it's remarkable and as you say it to me builds a huge interest in conservation and and the value of uh, you know in my mind photographic con conservation photographic yeah. safaris in as opposed to let's say hunting safaris which is another debate that i don't want to get into but no, the value not. of of an animal's life uh, you know in terms yeah. of of photography and people's interaction yeah. Anyway, Tandi was 16 years old when she died. Uh, she'd raised many cubs successfully and possibly one of the world's most famous leopards. So go easy, old Tandi, and thank you for your, your time and effort. And unfortunately, as we were saying, uh, you know, Tandi uh, suffered exactly what Russell and I were describing earlier on, uh, an unfortunately violent death at the end of a successful life. All right, everyone, that's all we have time for this afternoon. We'll see you same time next week. I'll be in a different place, which will be quite fun. Russell will probably be in the same place, but whether it will be facing the same direction, only he can tell. Until then, bye-bye. <laughs>